With the exception of last week, we were starting 2018 by looking at the Christian life, uh, looking at some areas of our lives where we could possibly improve upon this year. And this morning, even though it's not so much an area that we can improve upon, it's something that I think can really uh, help us get through the difficult times in our lives uh, when we really take this uh, passage to heart that we're going to look at this morning. And it is a passage that I think is very inspirational um, no matter where we are in life. But before I do go to the actual verse, um, I want to read a verse that maybe you have heard this one before. And the verse goes like this. God will never give you more than you can handle. I don't know if anyone has ever heard that quoted before. Um, every now and then I hear people uh, quote that and it sounds very inspirational. But there's one big problem with that verse. And that is that it's not in the Bible. <laughs> Yeah, you can check any concordance to any number of translations, and uh, frankly, you're going to find Jimmy Hoffa before you find that <laughs> verse in your Bible. Uh, you might actually find it next to the verse that says, God helps those who help themselves. Uh, that's not in there either. It's sort of to burst your bubble if you thought that was in there too. But why, why do people quote this verse that isn't even in the Bible about God not giving us more than we can handle? Well, in short, I think a lot of it's because people simply don't know their Bible. They haven't read it. Um, more likely, though, maybe someone uh, was well-intentioned and quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which we will read shortly, but someone else put it in their own words and came out with this other verse about God not giving us more than we can handle. But in doing so, in misquoting what is actually in the Bible, we create some really bad theology too. And we'll get to that later, but now I'd like to do what we always should do, and that is go to the actual Bible and see what it actually says. We will um, read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first 13 verses. And if you're following in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 811. And I'm reading from the beginning of the chapter just to give you more of the context of what uh, the Apostle Paul is writing about. Because without that context, you might think that it means God won't give you any more than you can handle, and that's not what he's talking about at all. So beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, the word of the Lord says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that your forefathers were all under the, under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in the Moses in the cloud and, and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also, also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. 
May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. It should be clear from reading this passage that Paul is writing about sin. Okay, he's not talking about us dealing with the burdens that we handle on a daily basis or how much we can handle at all. Now, just a couple minutes ago, I said that this passage should give us inspiration, and even though I opened with a fake verse that is not in the Bible, I was not kidding about the inspiration of the real passage. And that's why I want to call your attention to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, which says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This verse should be more inspiring to us than that fake verse that people make up and quote about God not giving us more than we can handle. So by misquoting that verse, we're actually reducing our view of the loving nature of God. And I'll explain that in a minute, but... First of all, and this may sound surprising, but the Bible actually tells us that God will at times let us endure more than we can handle. If he didn't do that, then we wouldn't have any reason to rely on him, now would we? The most humble yet strongest believers in the world are the ones who have experienced situations that they simply couldn't handle by themselves. So they were forced to rely on God to get through them. On the face of it, it seems like God is mean and vindictive for allowing us to experience these things. But we need to realize that God is more interested in creating strong disciples. And this is simply the best way to do that. Therefore, the fake verse of not God not giving us more than we can handle is simply not true. Based on, it's based on a lie that God doesn't want us to experience anything bad in this world. You see, the spirit of that fake verse that I keep calling it is the opposite of what we read in the Bible. Yet many people think that this verse gives us some sort of consolation when, during the dark times in our lives but we are selling God short. I don't know about you, but I am much more encouraged to know that God chooses to prove his love for me by allowing me to see all the things that I have gotten through in life all because of him, because he has pulled me through every single one of them. In other words, he proves his love for us by carrying us through the difficult times rather than keeping us from those difficult times altogether. Take the prophet Jeremiah, for instance, back in the Old Testament. He's a good example because he is known as the weeping prophet. So it shouldn't surprise you that the weeping prophet has endured certainly his share of tough times. Among other things that Jeremiah endured, he was lied about, or lied to, and about, mistreated, and he was even left in the bottom of a well, of a well to starve to death at one, one time. If that's not more than a person can handle, I think we're getting pretty close to it. In chapter 38 of his book, we read the lies that were told about Jeremiah as he writes, then the official said to the king, This man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city, as well as all the people, by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of the people, but their ruin. It goes on to say they lowered Jeremiah by ropes down into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud, and Jeremiah sank down into the mud. Then it goes on to say, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death, where there is no longer any bread in the city. I think in most people's opinion, this is probably more than a person can handle. 
Yet God allowed it to happen to Jeremiah, to his own prophet, to a man very close to him too. You see, God's people never, never have it easy. And if that's what you want, a religion where you have everything that you want, then Christianity is probably not the one for you. When bad things happen to us, many Christians equate this to God punishing us for the things we've done. But they're, they're sadly mistaken. You see, God, al God allows this to happen to his children, so if, we had, if you have had a difficult life, you're in very good company with the people that we read in the pages of Scripture. Take the Apostle Paul, for instance. In the 11th chapter of his second letter that we have to the church in Corinth, he writes about the abuse that he faced while serving the Lord. Again, how much can a person handle? Well, consider that as we look at the things that Paul writes about. He writes, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged, which is beaten, more severely, have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Stop there quick and do the math for you. Five different times he was uh, lashed 39 times. It's 195 lashes in his life. And I wonder if he probably would have rather had them done all at once rather than to have 39 lashes and then 39 another time, and 39 a third time, and 39 a fourth time, and 39 a fifth time. But back to his words now, he says, three times I was beaten with rods, and once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, I spent a night and a day in the open sea, I had been constantly on the move, I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked the end of Paul's words about that and it's an awful lot for a person to handle isn't it I'd actually say it's too much for a person to handle but just like the prophet Jeremiah Paul relied on God to get through it all I could go on and on with similar examples but they all mean the same thing that God doesn't deliver us from the difficult situations we face he delivers us through those difficult situations. Amen. Now I'd like to move on from a discussion of the fake verse that's not in the Bible to something that really is there. In passage, Paul's passage in 1 Corinthians 10, he talks about, or he's not talking about us handling the difficult situations that we face, but he's really talking about sin. He writes that even when we are tempted to sin, we can avoid sin because God will always provide a way out. And if you want an inspirational verse, how about the second half of 1 Corinthians 10:13, where it says, God will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This is a verse that's often twisted, but what Paul's talking about is when we find ourselves in a difficult situation where we may be tempted to sin, God will always provide us a way out so that we don't have to sin. Now think of it this way. Something that has become a tradition in my family uh, is that uh, every fall we go to these corn mazes Okay, and I know some of you have been to these places, and I must say we go to these corn mazes against my better judgment, too. <coughs> I'm not a maze kind of person, but <coughs> I suck it up and do it anyway. 
And this past year, for the very first time ever, we went to a particular maze where we had printed out a map, an aerial view map of the maze before going in to see if we could actually complete it that way. It's obvious that attempting a maze with a map is a lot easier than wandering aimlessly among corn stalks, wondering if I'm ever going to have a hot meal again or ever sleep in my bed again because I can't get out of a corn maze. And, you know, as I'm in these mazes wandering about and wondering, you know, I've already seen the same stalk of corn five times, I have visions of a local news anchor reporting area man found dead in corn maze. <laughs> Passers by report hearing screams but didn't want to risk their own skin by going in to rescue him. That kind of thing. Might be a little bit of an exaggeration there, but not much. <laughs> but in the context of Paul's passage about God providing a way of escape when we face a potentially sinful situation, I think of it like the corn maze. The maze is like the temptation for us, and the map that we had ahead of time is God providing a way out for us without falling into sin or winding up on the local news. I don't have to wander around wondering if I'm ever going to get out of this. <clears throat> we have a map right in front of us. A more serious example about this con concerns a man named Stephen Bennett. And he's a man who knows about finding his way out of sin all too personally. His life includes alcoholism, drug addiction, and even homosexuality. His life is like a soap opera, yet unlike those shows, his story is true. I can't get into all the details of Stephen's life right now, but he, he admits that he had over 100 gay partners in a span of 11 years. But he says one day his doorbell rang, and there was a woman who was an old friend of his who showed up out of the blue, and she began to talk to Stephen about Jesus. In Stephen's own words, he said, she showed me how Jesus changed her life and how, according to the Bible, homosexuality was wrong. It was a sin and an abomination in God's eyes. How, according to the Bible, I was not born that way, yet, in fact, it was a choice of a lifestyle. And Jesus could set me free from it today. I listened intently, and something inside of me told me she was right. That day, the Word of God cut right through me. I saw my homosexuality for the first time as God saw it, that's sin. But for Stephen, the turnaround wasn't immediate, but eventually he got there. And this was quite a while ago. He says, that day in January of 1992, I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he set me free from homosexuality for good. That day God changed my life forever, and I will be eternally grateful for, to him for what he did. Within two weeks of that time, I moved out of my partner's home and was on my way and walked with Jesus Christ. Stephen would go on to give up drugs. He would marry a woman and have children with her. And then he would start a ministry aimed at converting homosexuals from their sin and converting them to everlasting life in Jesus Christ. Stephen's story is proof of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10, that God promises to provide a way of escape from our sin. Once Stephen gave his life to Jesus, his eyes were then opened to see the way out of his sinful lifestyle. For those of us here, even though we may not struggle with homosexual urges like Stephen did, we still find ourselves mired in a variety of sins. And in life, there are very few nevers and very few always. But here is one. The good news is that God promises us that he will always provide a way out. The biggest problem for most people is they simply don't want the way out. They want to continue enjoying this sin that they have become accustomed to, whether it's drugs, sex, materialism, you name it. Sadly, Many Christians like to point fingers at everyone else for the things that they do. 
but they want to condemn their actions before looking into the mirror to see what sin they are actually secretly enjoying. If you truly want to be Christ-like, which should be the goal of every Christian believer, you need to call sin what it is, and that is sin, and then ask God to show you the way out. The good news is that if you ask him, you then have the confidence to know that he will provide that promised way out. And on to the last point this morning in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul makes a point after providing an Old Testament example for us. Paul refreshes the minds of the readers about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt back in the days of Moses. Verse 4, Paul tells us that even though Christ was not there in bodily form, Christ was still with the Israelites wandering through the desert. He writes, for they drank of that spiritual rock that, was, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It's interesting that in some translations, I don't believe the NIV does it, but uh, some others, they will actually capitalize the R in rock to show that this is a reference to Jesus. They're certainly not talking about uh, Dwayne Johnson, the rock, by the way, by doing that, but they are talking about Jesus. And it's a pretty clear statement that Paul is confirming that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. As we look at the situation of the Israelites where they were wandering in the wilderness, in light of the fact that we know that Christ was with them all along, we gain insight about the nature of Christ. This insight applies to us when we are tempted because the Israelites were also tempted in many ways during their journey through the wilderness. One thing that we see is that God never left the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. God will never leave nor forsake us in that same way. And whether your sin is a secret one or a more public one, maybe there is a time when you are urged to do wrong by someone else. God promises to provide a way out. Maybe your boss at work wants you to falsify records or lie to a potential customer about the benefits of a product. What Paul is telling us is that if we seek God during these situations, he will lead us out without having to sin. And this is another thing that God provides for us, for those in the wilderness, which was a way out. To use the words of Paul, God provides for the Israelites a way of escape. Just think that God provided a very unlikely way of escape for the Israelites by parting the Red Sea. And we may be surprised at the ways that he provides a way out for us, too. In the same way that the Israelites didn't see God's hand until they were backed up against the sea with nowhere to go, we can't fall into despair if we don't see God's hand at work immediately before things get desperate. Then that's the thing about faith. If we knew the mind of God and if we knew the insight that he has into the inner workings of things, we wouldn't need to exercise faith at all. God provides the faith to us as believers in Jesus Christ. So I want to wrap up this morning by saying that this is a wonderful passage of scripture with a promise that God makes to us. The Bible tells us he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. This doesn't mean that God isn't going to ever give us more than we can handle. The verse has nothing to do with that at all. The verse that is actually here applies to us every single day because we are tempted to sin virtually every single day. Not just when things get rough or if we wonder if we can handle the things that life throws at us. When we are tempted, we can't just throw up our hands either and give in to the temptation because it's too great for us. We need to remember that we serve a God that is much greater than the temptation that we are facing. The temptation is there to grow us as believers, 
And there's nothing, no better way that we can see God's work in our lives is when we resist the temptation and flee from it because it becomes a testimony of the greatness of God. We can then tell people that we were tempted in a certain way, and but by the grace of God, he got us through it, and we never failed him. So I urge you to make 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that go-to verse. Maybe you write it on a card, an index card, and put it on the corner of your mirror, or put it on your desk at work, or with computers nowadays, somehow work it into your desktop background or your screensaver or whatever the case is. Better yet, commit it to memory because it is, first of all, the Word of God. It is very important. And secondly, it is a promise from God that applies to us every single day. It is a wonderful gift of God and it is something that we should cherish all year round. Let us now go to Him in prayer.